All right. Well, thank you for attending. And uh, it's nice to be here in Berlin again. I've lost count of how many times I've been here, so I think that's a pretty good sign. Um, and uh, yeah, so I'm, I'm here to teach my IDDD workshop. It's a three-day workshop on uh, implementing domain-driven design, so how do you actually use DDD in a project. Um, and I'm glad to say that there's big interest in, in Berlin regarding uh, learning DDD and practicing it, so that's, that's good news. Um, and tonight I'm discussing uh, reactive DDD, so we're adding, um, I'm adding a little bit of a twist to domain-driven design, and, and if you followed my work at all, you probably know uh, over the past several years I've been um, working in a, you know, sort of a reactive setting with domain-driven design and, and really promoting that. So I hope to convince you tonight that, that uh, using um, reactive software development techniques along with DDD is, um, is a, um, you know, it's a good approach to software development. And the other thing is, you know, like even if, you're, even if you decide not to use reactive programming, I think you'll still glean a lot from uh, the, the basic DDD discussions tonight. So, um, so this is, you know, a talk specifically about transforming digital business. Um, who here is working like in a pure startup that is doing something you think totally unique with digital um, assets of some kind? No. <laughs> no? There are no startup people here doing, what is it? I mean, I'm, I'm just so, wait a minute. Uh, I'm at a, what does this company do? They, they do what? Huh? Delivery. Is, is that not a unique, um, you know, digital experience for people? I mean, I don't know. I, where I live, uh, I can't have pizza and stuff delivered. I live sort of out of the city. And uh, while I like it, there is a bit of inconvenience. So I think, you know, food delivery is, is um, a great uh, service to offer to people, especially if they don't have to think much about it, right? Just click, click on their phone and ding dong or whatever, right? Somebody shows up with, or knock, whatever. Somebody shows up with a pizza or whatever it happens to be. Um, I spent some time in, in Dubai a few years ago. And, uh, you know, the, the really um, sort of, well, I was going to say the wealthy people in Dubai, but there are pretty much no others. <laughs> and um, so they really, you know, want that kind of service too. So delivery, um, doing things for them is, you know, is pretty uh, important to them. So I think, you know, that's, that's a good thing. Um, is anyone here in uh, sort of involved in enterprise digital transformation? Okay, good. Shout out, what are you, what are you guys working on? Yeah. What is it? I, it's a discounter, German discounter. Oh, German discounter, okay. And so have they been in business for a number of years? Yeah. And they are, yeah, so I'm sorry, I don't, I don't know the, the name. I probably should. I, I know, what is it? It's a supermarket. Oh, a supermarket. Oh, okay, yeah. But, but now you are, what is it? Wait, I, I'm going to guess you're the competition. <laughs> okay, no. Well, yeah, so there's, I think transformation is a big thing, right? We're trying to figure out how to do things differently, how to make things more efficient. I, at least I hope that there is an effort to make um, people's experiences more efficient and to use software and computing in a more efficient way. And I think that this is my main message this evening. So um, in case you're, you know, you, you're probably more familiar with my uh, work with 
books on domain-driven design, this IDDD book that's called the Red Book in, in the DDD community, but, um, and, and my distilled book. But I've also you know, started this reactive platform, so I, I guess uh, since nobody had to promote me to chief architect, I, I just grabbed that title myself. <laughs> and, uh, but I'm, you know, so we're, we're developing this um, reactive platform called Vlingo, and it literally means, you know, basically first initial of, of my name and lingo. So um, it's, uh, it's a, a tool set for doing reactive programming, but um, using domain-driven design. So lingo language, right? Um, so it's a very language-driven, very fluent um, kind of host for, for uh, DDD applications that also and, and services that also work um, reactively. Okay, so um, if you're not so familiar with domain-driven design, I just want to kind of uh, set a foundation for sort of the, the major, um, you know, aspects of, of what DDD helps you with. So domain-driven design, um, defines as kind of this fundamental aspect the bounded context, okay? And the bounded context is a place where the way that a team expresses itself um, in language about the concepts that, of the problem that they're trying to solve with software you know, where this language has context. So when you have conversations with, um, let's say, product owners, um, business people, when you read requirements, what's happening with that experience? You are, you are consuming, you know, through your eyes, through your ears, uh, and, you know, language, right? And you're talking back to people, you're, you're replying to them, and you're using language to do that. And so um, language is obviously a very natural part of, you know, the human experience. It's how we get things done. Ultimately, we have to talk to each other, if, you know, and, and we have to express ourselves. We have to communicate what's in our mind, what, you know, what do we think about the software that we're developing. And so DDD is about capturing those conversations and the rules and constraints and the elements that we envision in our mind into a model, into a software model. And the bounded context sets a specific boundary around a given language. Um, well, that may sound a little bit complicated, but let's just imagine here for a second that we're talking about um, a clinical treatment context. In a clinical treatment context, you probably have um, some kind of a patient, what we might refer to as a clinician, maybe some treatment machines, medical machines, um, a record of the person's health, and a doctor or some doctors. So these are just elements that we have in our language. And that seems rather obvious. But the interesting part of the language um, is not only the names, but the communication between the objects. So if, if you've... Uh, you know, been around object-oriented programming long enough, you've probably heard of uh, Alan Kay. Alan Kay invented object-oriented programming and the small talk language. And Alan Kay, you know, his advice to us is that the really interesting part of object-oriented programming, what the object-oriented experience was supposed to be, is the objects and the messages sent between them the communication between objects. And that we should actually, yeah, don't tell uh, Uncle Bob that I said this, but you know, I'm only repeating what Alan Kay said, but don't, 
don't worry so much about the inside of the object. Not that you want to design it poorly, of course, but we, we often make such poor decisions about the communication language between the objects and spend so much time refining the inside of the object that the outside has almost no meaning to business people or even team members who you know, arrive later. Or maybe even you after a month after you've written the code, right? Like you go back and what was I thinking? You know? so, so actually, the really important message of, of objects is capture the language of the messaging going between objects. Pretty neat, right? And simple. So, so we not only have a patient and a clinician and a, and a doctor and a machine, but what kind of language do we have to describe setting up the machine for a patient's treatment? Is there a language around that? Yeah, there is. And what is the language around uh, the clinician running the machine and taking readings from the machine as to the progress of the patient's treatment. All of these things are linguistic, you know, language-oriented expressions, and we want to capture those, and we want to reflect those um, in our software model. Really important, really important. So this is um, really kind of the foundation of what DDD is about, and so keep that in mind. Now, I think that there is... Um, what, what happens in software development these days often is uh, developers make their co core domain something like this. And, and if you don't know what a core domain is in DDD, a core domain is sort of like the most, one of the most important things that you can work on in a company because um, this is what's going to help distinguish your company from all others, this is how you excel in business. And so this is what we choose as a core domain. And yet, I think part of the problem with developers is our core domain, our own core domain, tends to be the fear of missing out. You know, and, and it's sort of expressed like this. So we're, we realize that we fear missing out on something, and so we're at 1.0 of the fear of missing out core domain. And then we decide that we need to make some you know, modifications so that we can uh, model this correctly, and version 1.1 ends up like this, right? <laughs> so here's our fear of missing out model, and now, right, we're, the Kubernetes and Kafka are upstream from us, and we're totally dependent on that. That's solving all of our problems, because of course you can solve every business problem with Kubernetes and Kafka these days. Of course, you used to be able to do that with Ajax, um, Comet after that, and what it, yeah, you get the point, right? So, developers, like, care about the business. You know, they're the ones paying you, right? So, so help them excel at what they should do. And if you need Kubernetes, that's cool. If you need Kafka, that's cool. But, like, if you don't really need them, then don't force it. Don't you know, you don't have to use them in, in everything that you do, and certainly don't make your projects subject to them to the extent that they totally control you, right? So um, I want to just say that DDD is about learning. So the more that we can learn with domain-driven design, um, <clears throat> you know, the, the better off we are. And I just want to point out, too, that uh, how many here are using Scrum in a project, okay? Kanban or Kanban, however you like to say it, yeah, some. Um, so I think there, there are enough people here that would say that they're using Agile. Um, I, you know, I don't know. I'm not going to try to judge that. But you know that there are four, there are four main reasons to use, um, to put a backlog item in a product backlog in Scrum. Can you name them for me? Anybody here name those? What is it? What's one? Just tell me, what, what's the first reason to put a backlog item into a product backlog in Scrum? Well, okay, it may, the, product, the backlog item may have a priority, but what's the number one reason? What is it? Yes, user need or a, a new feature, right? So we're going to put something up there for a feature. 
What's the second reason? Bug, Bug fix, okay. Third reason? Sorry. Nope. Well, I mean, okay, maybe technical work. Let's say technical work, maybe. Spike, but okay. But, but official, I'm just saying, I'm just talking official. So if you go down and like read, I'm not saying spike isn't, isn't appropriate, it is, but these are, these are sort of like the broader categories. So it's technical work, and then there's this fourth one. What is it? No, that would be either a feature or, or but, you know, something like that. What is it? Well, but do you put a backlog item in the product backlog for that? Okay, let me just save you from, from the, guess, the guessing game. What is it? No. No. Oh, my goodness. Let me just say it. It's knowledge acquisition. Boom. Right? Wait a minute. I've been using Scrum for... How many years, and I didn't know that. Now, again, wow, I, I could get assassinated for what I'm saying tonight. Probably will, too. Um, you know, if you go to the official blogs of agile leaders in the industry and read, what is the definition of knowledge acquisition? You know what the classic example is? I mean, I'm not going to tell you, but one of them has a series of green books <laughs> with a signature on it. And you can go to this individual's website, and the description of knowledge acquisition is actually this. Evaluate a JavaScript library. <laughs> and yet... Like, do we want to learn anything at all about the business and what the business needs are? Should that be a good reason to put a sticky note on a task board? Well, I'm going to recommend that it is. How much do you know about the business, right? Have you taken the opportunity to learn about the business to reflect the model that you're going to build for the business so they make money? so that you make money, right? And it's just not the next startup, because that startup failed. OK, so learning is a big deal in DDD, and it's a big deal in Scrum. It should be. That's one of the four main tenets of, of Scrum. So remember that. So learning begets knowledge. <laughs> knowledge changes everything. If you don't know what you're doing, you're lost. The more you learn, the more you know, the more you know, the better decisions you're going to make about the software. <clears throat> and even when you think you know everything, there's still much more to know. And that's the way it goes. OK, so what is reactive DDD? <laughs> reactive DDD is. Um, First of all, let's just define reactive. So if you go to the Reactive Manifesto uh, website, you'll find that the, the main four um, sort of features of reactive is, first of all, message-driven. Okay. Reactive is message-driven. And, and message-driven underlies everything else about reactive. So it enables responsiveness. It enables resilience. It enables elasticity. Now, it doesn't mean that you can't achieve any of these other things without reactive software development, but um, reactive does make these things much more possible. Now, for example, yesterday I sat in on um, a presentation that compared Spring Framework or Spring Boot to, um, to what's the new name of the JEE uh, something profile, something? Micro profile, yeah. And not only is micro profile almost an exact, you know, mirror image of Spring uh, annotations, but um, 
But, you know, like if you want your, an object to be resilient, you put an annotation on it and you tell this object that it's resilient because of something and you kind of, I don't know, sort of describe how it might crash and what, you know, what should happen about it. Pardon me if I'm wrong about that, but it's just that I, I didn't, I sort of quit listening. <clears throat> so, the, um, so with reactive, resiliency is built in to the very model of how the software is, is built, how it's designed. And that's because, um, as I'll show you later, um, reactive components have supervision. They have supervisors. And when there's a crash, some kind of problem with a reactive component, the, um, the, the resiliency is achieved by the supervisor determining what should happen with this component that just um, threw an exception. Okay. How serious is the exception according to what I understand about the kinds of exceptions that might occur with this uh, component? And so you actually have this intelligent supervisor that says, well, I think that under this condition, we can restart you know, this component. Or we can just resume. Its state is probably safe because it was just this kind of um, um, exception and so forth. And, and so all of these things are enabled by messaging. For example, my component, my reactive component, throws an exception. That exception is reified into a message and sent to the supervisor. And the supervisor receives that message asynchronously, and it makes the decision in its own, at its own pace and says, okay, this is what we should do about that. And um, then it sends a message back and tells the actor, you know, or the, the reactive component what to do. Okay, so that's sort of this overview of reactive in general. And then, of course, reactive DDD is using reactive in a business-driven environment. This is where you are you know, more concerned about the business than you are about um, you know, the, the technical um, mechanisms in your architecture, like a certain kind of database or a certain kind of message uh, mechanism or, or something like that. Okay? And then um, this is what I was uh, talking about before um, Alan Kay, the inventor of OO, said that the actor model retained more of what he thought was the good features of the object idea. And so what I'm going to talk about next is how the actor model provides these reactive uh, qualities and, um, and then how you might go about using the actor model for reactive. Okay, so first of all, this is what most of us are used to and what we've been doing for ages, right? This is where um, we have a client object. And I just want to say, this is an object. This is just like, you know, this could be a Java object. It could be a C-sharp object. Any, any sort of object that can invoke a method on another object. So when I say client and server, I'm talking client and server in the sense that Rebecca Werfsbrock um, talks about client and server. A server is an object that provides a service. A client is an object that's dependent on that server object. Okay? So it invokes a method. What happens when the client invokes a method on the server? It blocks, right? It literally just stops until the server object returns, either with um, a result or some kind of a void, you know, non, uh, <clears throat> you know, a unit type of, type of result. Um, but the point is, right, most of the software that we write is actually not using the computer very efficiently, not the kinds of computers that we have these days. Um, now, just for what it's worth, I've been using multi-threading for a long time. I started using multi-threading in about, uh, was it 1986, somewhere around there. And, wow, oh, man, I really thought threads were cool. Um, 
and they are. You know, they, you can get a lot of stuff done with them. But at the time, I was using a 286 processor, and, and there was only one, you know, the, the core and the processor. That was just one thing and um, together. And so all the sort of multitasking and multithreading had to be run through a scheduler in, in the OS. And there were no real truly, you know, multiple things running in the computer at the same time or at least through the CPU. Now we can do that very readily, right? I mean, this, this is like a four-year-old Mac, um, and I have eight cores on it. Unfortunately, only 16 gigabytes of RAM, you know. <laughs> um, but so I, I think you kind of get the idea what's happening with these cores most of the time. They're sitting idle because software is blocking. Um, now, if you go back to the year 1973, you'll find that uh, someone named Carl Hewitt started an effort. Uh, I believe it was at Carnegie Mellon University at the time, and he had some colleagues, and they were working on ideas that they saw as quite future, which were, um, you know, really fast networks, multiple processors in, in every computer, and... Carl Hewitt came up with this idea called the actor model. And the actor model is a, you know, sort of fundamental computing um, uh, technique where the computational units are actors. They're objects and they exchange messages between each other and they operate asynchronously. Now, if you go clear back to 1973, and I have to say, I didn't start programming until 10 years later, about 1983 is when I started programming, and look how many, um, uh, you know, the clock speed that existed back then, um, pretty slow, right? I mean, not even one megahertz of, of clock speed in 1973, and here's someone who's saying, ah, this is going to get way better in the future, you know? And it did, but not until, like, literally 30 years later, because here's what happened. You go to the year 2003, about 2003, and Intel and other processor manufacturers found out we can't make these things much faster anymore. And, yeah, they are finding ways to make them faster, but it used to be that, you know, there, there was this sort of doubling in clock speed about every, you know, Moore's Law said, I think he predicted it would be like every two years. It actually ended up being like every 18 months or so where processor speeds were doubling, Moore's Law. But that, that continued until 2003. So 30 years after, Carl Hewitt was, you know, working on the actor model, and then it just sort of went like, ooh. Now it, it takes about nine years to get the same sort of clock speed increases, and then what happened? Spectre and Meltdown, right? So, wow, we just lost a lot of, um, effectively, you know, clock speed or processor, you know, throughput because of, of those situations. Now, notice that transistors can continue to climb, but not clock speed. So, you know, I guess until maybe quantum computers really, really, truly work, um, who knows if that actually will happen in the next 20 or 30 years. Maybe. Maybe it'll beat that, you know, easily. But point is, we don't have that today. So what do we do about it? This is what we do about it, right? We use the cores. So while the individual processors aren't getting much faster, or they even regress because of vulnerabilities, you know, in, in, in the design of these chips, um, you know, we do have more processors. So I'll show you some stats, you know, some interesting numbers about the Xeon processor in a few minutes. And then, you know, of course, we, we say, okay, well, like I, I've got a language that supports multi-threading, and I've got a bunch of cores, so let me just implement threads. And it seems really easy until you start doing it. 
And, uh, and I just want to tell you, there are things that you will learn about multi-threading when you attempt this that you never, ever thought you would learn. And, you know, it just will blow your mind. And I'll tell you some stories about it. And you go, like, okay, threading is easy. All that I do is I just have a thread that feeds this queue constantly with new work. And then I just have other threads that are reading the work out of the top of the queue. And poo, we're away, right? Okay, well, <clears throat> there's that. And then there's, okay, but the task that was here and the task that was here are actually dependent on the same entity, or let's just say object, unique object, and there's blocking between the two because, you know, if they both enter that object at the same time, it, it can corrupt the state of that object, right, if they're both mutating the object simultaneously. And so something's going to have to lock. And how do we do that? Well, in Java, you know, we throw a synchronized keyword either around the method or some state, and we produce this lock. And you can do some, uh, some you know, compare and, and set kinds of spin locks and things like that to get around that so you don't actually block a thread. But the point is, it's really hard. And the other thing is, what you never see coming, it's amazing is that the Intel processor has a specific optimization built in where it's trying to predict what should be executed next, right? And so because it's predicting what executes next, it's taking a guess and it says, I'm going to go ahead and execute this next. And to this thread that's running this instruction right now, I will make certain that even though I'm taking a guess and running this, this instruction next, that that thread will, I will make that thread think that it wasn't actually executed until it should have been, so in the order in which it should have been. That's a guarantee that the Java language gives you with multi-threading. The thread that you are in sees the correct data mutations within the thread. You know what they don't tell you is that another thread that's dependent on a change happening in that data does not get that benefit. It actually sees that operation that occurred first that you think should happen later, and you react to that, and you cannot believe for a while you just sit there and shake your head and, there's, and you say, how can that line of code execute and the state is still what I don't expect it to be? It's impossible until you realize that this is just the way it works, you know, with certain VMs, right? You, you know what I'm talking about. You just go like, no, this can't be happening to me. And it does. So, you know, and, and this is where leveraging tools that help you deal with multi-threading in predictable ways are very, very, you know, well, uh, useful. So with the actor model, I have basically the same client kind of object that I had before, I'll call it a sender, and the server, we'll call it a receiver in this case because this is literally sending a message and this is receiving a message. And um, this is where we get the message-driven aspects of the actor model. And um, so when this sender sends this message to the receiver, this sender does not block. It simply enqueues a message for the receiver, and the receiver has its own sort of mini queue, um, or what's called a mailbox. And once that message is enqueued, the sender continues um, on its own thread, and the receiver will function later on um, when it receives a thread. And it may already be executing, um, you know, using another thread as it receives another message, but it will not process that next message until it finishes with the message before. So what does this produce? It is, it is vastly asynchronous, vastly concurrent and, and parallel when you have this kind of, you know, multi-core setting, and yet you're not dealing with these 
kinds of simultaneous mind-boggling changes that can occur because you just simply don't have that situation. The actor is running on a thread, it mutates its own state, and any state that anyone may ask that actor about later is going to be seen on the, on the next thread that's available to handle that request. And so any data that you share, and when I say share, I only mean send in a message, but you don't share a mutable state. I'll get into that later. But, but in essence, I have a predictable state that other threads are going to see because I read the state and handed it to them instead of them trying to see my state that may be completely in, in a completely unpredictable um, form right now as this happens on another thread. Okay. So, yeah, 1973, Carl Hewitt's, you know, world looked like this. Um, and so actors are reactive. They're, they're primarily, you know, supported by message-driven, and because they're message-driven, they're elastic and resilient and responsive, as I discussed before. And now, these days, what do we have? We've got these, you know, very fast, um, or I should say vastly, um, um, you know, core, core, multiple cores available, not necessarily very fast processors, but, um, and, and we have, you know, phones and big memory available. We've got the cloud really fast disks that are inexpensive, the network, and all of these things are, are quite you know, readily affordable, but still should be consumed efficiently, um, especially when you're in the cloud and, and you need to understand that you know, every, every cycle that you're using is, is costly there. So um, we need to embrace cores as part of our solutions, to offer efficient solutions. So we're not only providing efficiency for the users of our software, but we want our software itself to be efficient. And we can make efficient use of computers if we use cores to the maximum extent possible. And for example, the Xeon Phi um, has you know, coprocessors. It can scale from between like 88 and 200 plus, may, maybe even by now, uh, even more cores than this. This is, I think, a couple years old. Um, the other problem that we face with computers these days is that, you know, we use the network a lot. We are in a distributed computing environment constantly. And, you know, just in case you say, no, we're not really using distributed computing, are you using a browser in your solution? Does it talk to a server somewhere, anywhere, even if it's on-premise? And does that talk to a database somewhere? You're using distributed computing, right? Now, this can become vastly distributed by, you know, um, sort of breaking up your solution across um, a number of nodes. And these nodes have to talk to each other, and when they talk to each other, can you predict that the, um, that the network is going to be there for this invocation? Can, will the network um, be fast at the time that your request is made? Will the network be fast when the response is provided? So what can you do about this? Message-driven means that you are actually embracing latency. You are saying that my, my solution understands latency because I never, I never expect an immediate response from any request that I make. I expect that something may happen in the future. And if it doesn't, I'll deal with the fact that it didn't happen. But um, instead of basically blocking on something that we expect that actually may not happen, which can cause cascading failures, right? Um, so the idea is to be able to do more with less. Um, we, we don't have necessarily super fast processors, but we have way more of them, and therefore we can do more. So actors 
are about direct asynchronous messaging. So think of the client making a method invocation on the server, and yet it's not a direct method in invocation. It is, it is a direct message send. So it's like invoking a method, but that method is invoked latently. Okay. Um, it's lock-free, share nothing. So these three actors can be sending messages to this receiver simultaneously, and the receiver doesn't blow up you know, as, in essence, as, as we might expect with three objects um, entering another object through the same thread or, you know, or multiple threads um, hitting the same object at the same time, I should say, this simply doesn't happen with the actor model. And um, we prepare for our next message with actors. We can actually tell our own actor, become another kind of actor, to prepare for the next message that I receive because the actor is basically a state machine. Okay, so the actor says, oh, okay, I entered this state. I'm going to change my behavior based on the new state that I've, that I've just entered. And this is, for example, a, um, a supervision hierarchy where you have um, a hierarchy of, of uh, objects that understand how to supervise the object above it or the actor above it. And this is um, demonstrating how parallelism occurs and, and how there can be race conditions within actors, but they're not catastrophic races. They're simply races to say, which message do I receive first? And depending on the message that I receive first, I'll react to this differently than if I were to receive the messages out of a specific order. How many actors can you have in, um, on a node? Is it you know, 50, 100? It, it's actually millions of actors that you can have, just like you can have millions of objects running. Another advantage to the actor model is um, the simplicity that, that it affords you. So if you take a slice through a typical architecture, these are the kinds of components that you see um, through the architecture, right? You, first of all, you've got this sort of input side and an output side to your architecture, and you may have security, user interface, REST representations, um, or, you know, concept object representations, more security, transactions, task coordination, use case controller, entities, business logic, domain events, repositories, documents, cache, messaging, right? Right? Now, hire someone out of university and turn them loose on this, right? It, I mean, it's intimidating. Even, even a very accomplished architect or, or um, you know, developer can struggle with understanding things like this when they first uh, encounter it. On the other hand, with actors, um, we, we have basically what is a representation of a REST endpoint here, which is an actor that sends a message to a domain object, and that's kind of like your whole architecture. So introduce a junior programmer to this book concept and say, these are the messages that you need to handle and this is the state machine that you need to develop, and, the, and this is the language that we need to use to do this, and they can, they can do that. Now, it may take them a little time to wrap their mind around the asynchrony of the solution, but they actually don't even necessarily need to think much about asynchrony here. If you can teach them how to program a GUI right, a graphical user interface, like even with JavaScript, and I click on a button and I get what? I get an, I get an event, basically, that says I clicked, someone clicked a button, or click uh, a list box, right? How is it that you take the entry from a list box and put it into a text field when the user clicks on it? You get a message that says the user evidently just clicked the, the text box. I'm going to take the, the element out of that list box, and I'm going to put it into a text box, and in into a text field, right? 
If you can, if a, if a programmer can understand that, they can understand message receiving within a single object. It's really the same thing. It's the same thing. So, if I understand it right that you just map your domain objects to actors. Each domain yep. object becomes an actor. That is it. And uh, yep. instead of a classical object with methods, it has a they, 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 I offered my... Uh, Methods to to my clients and the clients called these methods synchronously, traditional, in a traditional way. And now you do it asynchronously yeah. with actors, uh, and just each domain object maps to an actor in your yep. Yep. bounded context. That is it. And and actually, you can invoke the methods, and I'll show you how in a few minutes. Okay, this this is really the cool part. Is you think oh, what am I doing? I'm using some sort of abstract messaging thingy and, and it just ends up invoking a method here? No. It, it's actually this thinks that it's invoking a me method directly on this domain object, but it's not. It's a message send instead. Okay, and I'll show you how that works. So when you think of actors, think of objects done right. It's really the message that... Um, that Alan Kay tried to share with the world. And so reactive DDD now is where you've got these sort of um, very highly scalable individual bounded contexts, services, microservices, if you will, um, that together form an entire system solution, a whole system, and the user can use any of these, whether it's you know, basically grabbing data from each one of these into a user experience or one at a time or whatever it happens to be. And so this is the idea behind reactive DDD. So we have strategic tools in DDD. So now I'm sort of going back into the DDD side of things. So I, I got through the, the reactive part. This is called a context map in domain-driven design. So when you have multiple bounded contexts, you usually like to, you need to understand how the multiple bounded contexts are dependent on each other, how the teams work with each other, and so we use context mapping to show that. And um, so each of these would be a bounded context and there's some dependency between them and it doesn't mean that it's, you know, like a, a very strong dependency, it could be, um, you know, um, loosely coupled dependency, and yet, um, you know, you're, you're still drawing the fact that that this may depend on this, or this may depend on this. So all of the all of the sort of loose coupling advantages can be applied all over this. But um, yes, um, the reactive aspect of GDD. That comes when you're implementing it, or do you already have an uh, reactive thinking when you make the domain driven design, when you're designing your domain object? Are you thinking of reactive, uh, or is the reactive part, the reactive aspect, only an aspect of the implementation? Hmm. Yeah, good question. I think it's a bit of both, because actually, even if we're not using actors within this bounded context, it's still reactive in the sense that if there are messages being exchanged between these two, you, you can still have a normal domain model, but you're reacting to messages asynchronously. So, yeah, right? The domain model isn't different whether it is reactive or not. No, it, well, uh, okay. L can, I, can I demonstrate that later? Yeah. Yeah, okay. So, so think about, you know, this sort of strategic big picture of, what are the relationships between bounded contexts? And then we have tactical tools in domain-driven design where we can design our entities. And again, we're interested in what are, in essence, the messages between objects now. So we have a well-understood um, you know, command being invoked on this entity and an event being emitted from the entity. And so we, we want a nice clear language around these ideas here, these concepts. And this is, this is shown, at, the reason I'm showing circles in this case instead of um, 
uh, rectangles is that I, I use circles to represent actors. But this could be just a, a plain Java object, right, or a plain C-sharp object, or whatever kind of object you may be using. Um, but in this case, I am showing that this is an asynchronous concept, but we can still, you know, think of it as having very specific behaviors that have good names, right? Okay, information exchange is important between the bounded context. This is where um, we see this bounded context appears to be downstream from this one. And we would make that determination because it is sending a command to this. This blue message represents a command message. And, um, and this context see, receives that command, does something, and it emits an event, which is the orange message being sent back. And it may also be that we uh, have a query sent here, and the query will return a document, for example, a document message. So we kind of think of these three um, sorts of, of messages as, as being a kind of typical message, commands, events, and documents. Okay. Um, and then what, the, what this message exchange represents is what's known as a published language. So between two contexts or any number of contexts, one bounded context will say, this is what I am willing to share about what I do with the outside world. And so we call that a published language. And that published language can be um, um, held in, a, in basically a registry where you have a, uh, a schema, a set of schemas that um, help the consumers of the published language to understand what, you know, what versions of these objects are there and when I consume one of them, what will be the, the format and you know, the, the um, composition of this kind of message. So it's a schema. Um, so we would say that reactive DDD tends to be um, pervasive throughout the system. Even if one bounded context is not implemented using actors, for example, it probably still is reactive in that there, there is very likely some messaging involved. And, and interestingly, too, sometimes we dismiss REST as kind of this quasi-RPC mechanism or you know, way, to, way to exchange information. REST is actually referred to as messaging. You exchange messages, and you can actually exchange messages in REST um, asynchronously, right? So you can, you can make a request of a bounded context to a REST endpoint, and that REST endpoint can reply with um, a result code or a status code that says, I'm going to tell you later right, what the result is of that. I accepted it, but I'm going to tell you later what, what that is. So you can even use REST in a reactive way. Um, OK, so I just want to talk for a minute about lean architecture, agile architecture, and so forth. This uh, architecture that I've sort of hinted at before is called ports and adapters. And the ports and adapters architecture is very handy for, in essence, de react designing reactively. So we design as architects and developers saying, we don't know right now. If we, are we going to support messaging? We don't know yet. It could just be that we, that we support REST and we have exchanging messages through REST, but will we, have, will we support RabbitMQ or SQS or Azure, you know, Azure, however you say it, message bus and, and things like that? You know, what will it be? Well, we can make those kinds of decisions reactively as developers where we can decide just in time how to handle those, and then at the middle is our domain model. So on, around the outside is how do we interact with the outside world, and inside is sort of the, you know, this is our pristine uh, model where we, where we reflect the business knowledge. 
And then the whole system architecture can reflect that same kind of design, overall architecture, and where you have dependencies between bounded contexts. But again, you can leverage this kind of uh, lean and emergent uh, architecture that way. So consider a bounded context as a design boundary. Um, the design boundary is where we design a ubiquitous language even around our REST endpoints or resource handlers if we support REST. Um, the entities, the, the documents within uh, that, that we can query and the user interface can be rendered through these documents. And we can even split, we can make um, sort of, you know, architectural or architecture pattern decisions where we decide to split the command model and the query model apart into two separate models and scale them separately and, and so forth. Um, now, I just want to talk about when you, when you introduce asynchrony, parallelism, you know, that sort of range of, of thing, you also introduce a high chance for uncertainty. Like, how do you deal with messages that are sent multiple times? How do you deal with messages that are received out of order that we sort of expect them to be in? How do we deal with the uncertainty of, you know, the network not being available? How do we deal with um, the uncertainty of if I block on, you know, some sort of disk I.O., you know, database, um, how are we going to deal with that uncertainty if, it's, it's, if the request is managed uh, in a latent way? So, first of all, um, Let's say that we are working in this clinical world um, where we have a machine over here that's treating a patient. So this would be like the, the patient treatment itself, the, where the patient is sitting, the clinician is actually working. But we have the representations of each of those things here. You know what that's actually called in, uh, in a digital world? It's called a digital twin, right? So. So literally, we have something here, and we're representing that. Um, I, and I, you know, digital twin fits into domain-driven design so well because we are trying to model the physical world, but in a useful way. Right? So, so we actually have a twin, potentially, of the machine. Now, the machine twin may not be here, or it may be here, depending on where we decide to, to solve that that problem. It could be that our, that our language and context says that we're going to solve the machine problem here. But the point is, we'll have a software object that represents the digital um, real world object. Okay? So when we, discon when we get disconnected from the network, how do we deal with that? Machine, the machine continues to produce data, and yet we can't tell the the clinical treatments context that this data has resulted because the network isn't there right now. The network could actually be gone for hours. When you get out into these remote places where patients are, are treated like for um, uh, dia you know, dialysis, kidney dialysis, um, renal failure, you know, people out in the middle of nowhere need treatments like this, and the network is very unreliable out there. The Internet's very unreliable. So you may have constant disconnects in the day. I mean, that can even happen in a big city like this with mobile, right? So um, anyway, what you can do is model using the disconnected operation pattern that says, I know enough about what I will in the future need to send, but I'm going to have some sort of local storage here, and my local storage will be based on events, things that happen, and so I can even order those. I can, I can maintain them in the order that they happened here, and if I need to drop some to make room, you know, while this is disconnected long term, when I finally get a connection back, I can send, you know, basically uh, some small blast of information over here, and, and hopefully I can recover um, the, the entire data set, or not recover, but send the entire data set over here using disconnected operation. So just think in terms of having 
like a, um, a temporary um, store here, and it doesn't even have to be disk. It can be um, memory or you know, flash memory or whatever it happens to be. So that's one way to deal with the uncertainty of the network. And, and again, the events are notations of the facts that have happened at a certain point in time. Okay. Um, how do you deal with duplicates? So here we have, let's say, a, a commutative uh, problem to solve. That's where um, we may receive duplicates of the same kinds of messages. And I just want to explain, in, a, in, a, in an event-driven architecture, technically what we have is, uh, well, we, we have events that are that are entering our bounded context, but we will typically um, translate those events into commands that tell our model, this is what you need to do, and we know that's what it needs to do because this happens somewhere else. So that's a causal um, rela relationship. Good, thank you. <laughs> and, uh, but if this is a commutative operation, it means that this can happen you know, once, twice, a dozen times, scores of times, hundreds of times, and it doesn't matter. It, it won't hurt this entity to receive that kind of stimulus multiple times. So we just, we can just let those messages through, and the state is the state is the state, right? It's a commutative operation. In mathematics, right, it's sort of that principle of 2 plus 3 is 5, and 3 plus 2 is 5, so just do that all day long, and you still get 5, right? The non-commutative is a little bit different, and this is where you need to keep the look-aside state that, that basically says, I've already seen this before. But notice, you can solve this problem in the domain model. Now, I want to make that clear. You'll, you'll read advice you know, from leading architects that, that say, Solve this problem in the infrastructure. Deduplicate messages or resequence messages in the infrastructure. I promise you, if you try that, it, it's going to end up being really difficult because you cannot determine how long you need to keep the look aside data. And, and even figuring out, like, I'll talk about sequence in a moment, but just try to avoid that and solve the problem in the heart of the software, in the domain model. All you have to do is keep a state that says, I've seen this before. I'm ignoring it, right? That's it. You just ignore it in the domain model. Simple. It's OK if you write a few if statements. That's OK. Yeah. Um, so you've got this look aside state, and you say, yep, I saw that. And that way, we only emit one event. Instead of an event for every single time that this happens, we emit one event because we know that the, that We've already seen it, and we refuse to emit another one because emitting another one would cause downstream problems, right? Or very likely would. Okay. Um, sequence. Yeah, we're out of sequence. So we see it. Um, message two delivered um, as a domain event. Here we're going to consume that and translate it as a command message, and notice that we expect one, two, and three kinds of these messages to arrive at some point. How do we deal with that when they're out of sequence? So what we do is we, we just allow them to come through in whatever sequence they arrive, but we understand in the state of the entity that um, that, for example, step one has completed, step one is, is x, step three is y, but two hasn't happened yet. And, the, and you know, the clock is saying, wow, this is really late, but the entity doesn't necessarily even need to know that. And once two finally arrives, we simply say, okay, we've got all three steps completed here. Let's now emit an event that says, or, or something, right? Whatever it is that the next step is here, you simply, again, handle it in the domain model. Now, try to resequence those at the infrastructure. Um, you'll find examples of that, but how long do you keep the look-aside data for the resequencing? When do you know that you're done with the resequencing? 
how do you know that, you know, just trying to get those identities or, or sequences into a database reliably can be quite difficult. So you can solve it a different way. So reactive is non-blocking, share nothing, right? And, and so when we talk about blocking, it's not that our software may never block. As soon as you use a database, unless that database supports um, an asynchronous driver of some kind, you're going to block on asking for the data. And, but if we block in a business object, that's not going to be good because the business object is now holding on to a thread that can't be used by other parts of our service. And so what do we do about that? Well, we are going to block. If you're using a blocking, for example, I.O. of some kind, you're going to block, and that's all there is to it. You, there are, we are starting to see some non-blocking uh, database drivers and so forth, you know, but, but they're not prevalent yet. So what can we do? We use smart blocking. We have a, connect, we have a, a thread pool for our, our service or application domain model objects, and we have a separate thread pool that has a very reduced number of, of threads, and so we're only blocking on threads that, that are available in this pool, and, and we keep the other threads available for here. And so maybe you're actually only using one or two threads here, and you can even potentially, you know, so, sort of a little bit over allocate these and uh, generally Java can handle that pretty well for you and, and the machine. Um, so smart blocking. Here's another one that can happen is, um, let's say that we have a buffer pool. Anybody here use byte buffer or anything like that? And, you know, byte buffers are, are pretty, uh, there's a lot of overhead and in allocating them. So if you can reuse byte buffers, it's a good idea. And so you might decide, let's create a pool of buffers. But when you exhaust this pool of buffers, it, um, even with the actor model, I've seen and, and you know, unfortunately experienced the, the downside of having a buffer pool where you, when you exhaust the pool, you can actually see live lock or deadlock in an actor because an actor may not be able to complete some operation because it's dependent on something else and there's no, and there's no buffer available. So um, what you can do is make, you know, do some smart sharing and make the, the buffer elat or the, the pool elastic and, um, and, and therefore you can, you know, basically when this thing is, has, you know, high demand on it, you simply uh, scale the buffers out and then you reduce the number of buffers when the demand reduces. Okay. Okay, so, you know, I was talking about this healthcare domain. Um, the learning that we have in healthcare in, in a clinical environment is, for example, what does the clinical data say? What, what happened with the patient's treatment? And how does the patient behave? How does how does, does the patient, patient show up for their treatments? Do they take their medication? What is their sentiment? Would they rather be treated at home or in a clinic? You know, so we have things like this to consider. We also have pharmaceutical data, which says given, you know, patients who take this kind of medication over this time frame within this age group and with this, these sorts of um, condition, you know, um, symptoms, you know, what happens with that. And, and we also have research data. So we can actually do um, some, some uh, machine learning about how to treat patients more accurately. And again, we can create digital twins um, for clinical data, for the patient behavior and sentiment. Um, and so, for example, we can have a digital twin around the actual machine, the medical, the medical machine that is, in this case, cleansing someone's blood from, from uh, body waste that isn't expelled naturally by the kidneys, for example, and so you've got to clean their blood or they would die. Um, so you can have a digital twin around the machine itself. Um, 
you can have uh, digital twins around the patient. What is their behavior? Do they take their medication? This patient is evidently using a home-based dialysis treatment. You can see the bed there. Probably he's going to lie down on his bed and, and wait for the treatment to end, but at least he doesn't have that you know, sort of extra hour of travel to, to a clinic and so forth. So we can model the patient's behavior in this way. So, um, you know, when, when a patient receives medical treatment, the machine is sending data over here. And notice we have a digital twin of the machine here in the clinical treatments. We have a physician, a, a clinician, or a, I'm sorry, a patient, a clinician, a doctor, and a machine. And the data that it is producing emits domain events. So the, the changes within the model emit domain events. And those domain events go into, for example, this diagnosis um, patient analytics model. And now we can model things such as um, what does the patient's behavior and sentiment tell us about them? What does the pharmaceutical treatment um, the medication tell us about that? What does other research data tell us about this disease? How can we crunch this data and make, you know, the life of the patient better? How can we help them? Well, you know, this is probably a core domain. If we are really truly trying to help people and not just charge, you know, the government for their treatments, then you know, you're probably going to be really concerned about this to improve their lives. Otherwise, you know, if that's not your core domain and trying to actually help people, if your core domain is, you know, charging like Medicare in the United States um, or Medicaid for those treatments and you just want to rake in the money, I mean, that's, that's up to those huge corporations. But this is, you know, a much more rewarding um, environment to work in. So, we'd be good to model around that. So how do we do this in a fluent way, right? So now, okay, wow, a lot of information I'm throwing at you here. And uh, now we get to look at some code, okay? Um, fluent. So wouldn't it be nice if the actual tools that we use are fluent? And if you've used, like, the Java... SDK for long enough, or JDK long enough, right? Um, you know that fluency has not been a, a real partner to, to Java developers, and maybe it's slightly better on .NET, but I question that because, wow, what, why, you know, anyway. Uh, why do we return a task from a business object? And why do we name that business object blah, 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 grain, you know? So we leak the framework all over the business model. We, call th we name things async. Notice, you're not going to see any of that here because we're, we're more concerned about modeling the business, okay? And the tools that we're using, it, they're fluent. So when I have um, uh, an asynchronous outcome, so the outcome will happen at some point in the future, I don't know when, I simply register a number of functions that will be used when the asynchronous parts of the, the um, um, solution complete. And the other, so this is on the sort of client side, this is on the service side, and this is where the service says um, completes with outcome, right? But it's the, it's the part of the ubiquitous language that is the name of the outcome. On the client side, within the, the actor system, we're saying, first I want to do this, and then I want to do this, and then I want to dispatch that asynchronously to another actor, and then I'm going to consume that here. So it's, it's very expressive. And so let's say that we want to model this machine, right? So we have a machine that has some kind of criteria that we've, we've got settings on the machine, and we have, and this is, a, this is an actor, but it's an object that models the machine itself. It's the digital twin. And the digital twin will report vitals through this, vi or machine readings, I should say, through a vitals, and the vitals 
will talk to a treatment that is basically a proxy to the other side of the solution that's running server side. So this is running at the clinic. How might that look? So we can tell the machine to gather patient vitals. <laughs> can you believe it? You can actually read this code. We know what it means, right? This is actually how we talk. We don't talk in terms of machine set patient ID. Machine set, do we talk that way? I mean, we do in our software, but we don't talk that way as humans. So why should we talk that way in our software? Um, machine gather patient vitals. Treatment record vital, vitals read. So this is actually an event. Now, here's just a little example of how that might be implemented. So the machine is already operating. It's reading data from its digital twin, right? The, the actual machine itself, the digital twin, is consuming the information. And as it does so, it just simply dispatches that through a reactive stream, and the reactive stream tells the vitals on next. Now notice, this on next is not outside facing the rest of our model. It's only inside. We are a subscriber to a flow, which is a reactive flow subscriber of readings. That's what we receive. But on next is not part of our ubiquitous language. This is technical. This is part of a framework that's provided by, for example, the Java uh, development kit. What do we want to do with this machine reading that we receive? We want to create an event, vitals or vitals read from reading. And then we tell the treatment, record that event. This is actually sending something remotely, right, back to the server, and it's doing so in a, in a reliable way so that we don't lose that data because it is vital to the patient's treatment. Okay? Now, let's say that we're at the rest endpoint where this treatment is actually saying record the event. Now we're on, so this, this is on the machine side in the clinic itself. Now we're at the server side and we say grid, ah, so we have, a, we have some kind of a compute grid that we're using asynchronously actor of the treatment ID, and this is what we want out of that. And then we say, and then to, so I'm going to asynchronously, when, when, when the grid tells me asynchronously, this is your treatment object, I'm going to say, okay, I received this treatment. Now dispatch treatment, record vitals. We're on the server side now, right? Now I have the same language over here, but Imagine what's happening. This is, in essence, a, a proxy to the actual server side. But I'm expressing it naturally on both sides of the solution. Now notice, what if the treatment isn't there for some reason? Well, otherwise, no treatment, respond of, response of not found. Or, after we get the treatment vitals recorded, and then recording, serialized recording, and what do we get from that? We get a serialized data object that we're going to respond with an OK of the data. For example, that's just one thing that you can do. So on both sides of the equation, everything is asynchronous and everything um, is fluent, and we're actually talking the language of the business here. Okay. Um, this is all available in, in the Vlingo platform, um, available today in .NET. We're, we're, near, we're just within a few days of releasing 0.8.3, and we're also building a .NET edition of this. Um, this includes things like the schema registry that I referred to earlier, uh, which we're building now. It's, it, this, this specific part of the platform is currently has been delayed a bit, but um, this is where we can, in a type safe way and in a version safe way, describe the, the different um, you know, uh, means of our published language that we are communicating with the outside world. So 
the outside world can consume proposals submitted. Um, you know, this is not the medical, but actually, you know, a little bit different example. Um, you can, this is all actually available. These uh, slides are available in the, in the Vlingo documentation. Go to vlingo.io if you want to look it up. So actors run in a world, and worlds have at least one stage, which, which is the default stage, but maybe you want to create a, another stage or two that, that uh, actors in a specific solution run in, whereas you just want the system level actors, the world level actors running in the default stage. And then you have, you know, plugins such as common supervisors, schedulers for, for asynchronous scheduling, um, proxies. And these proxies are important, and I want to show you why. Because this um, behavior that I showed before here is I look up an actor, which is a treatment actor, domain object. What do I actually get back here? I get back a proxy to the treatment not the actual treatment itself. And so when I invoke treatment.recordVitals, that is reified into a message that is put into the actual treatment actor's mailbox and handled asynchronously. And for the most part, you don't have to worry about the proxies. There, you, know, you can generate them uh, in the build process, but if you don't, they're generated at you know, system startup, boom, it, it just happens and you don't even notice it. You know, so um, that's a nice behavior to get. And now you've got this, like I said, the simplicity stack where you kind of have controllers or, you know, resource endpoints, resource handlers, your domain model, and you've got your persistence, which actually you don't pay too much attention to because the aggregate itself doesn't even have to know about persistence. It just all kind of works for it. For in, be, in its behalf. Uh, we, we have all totally reactive HTTP servers, so support REST through um, completely reactive uh, actors. Um, so ser you know, services are using our endpoints to do things, and this is all running in a cluster. These actually represent cluster nodes. And the clustering is also reactive. We provide it through Vlingo cluster. And then Lattice, the Vlingo Lattice is the um, uh, um, auth directory, Th these are just some examples of some of the platform components, Vlingo Streams, v Vlingo Lattice. Lattice is specifically uh, sort of that compute grid, right? It's the, it's, we've got this cluster of nodes and this actor wants to send a message to this actor but the two actors on, are on two different nodes it just sends the message and the message ends up on the other node um, you know, asynchronously and, and the actor receives it. And this has all the whole you know, um, cluster management of leader election and, and failure and leader re-election and, and things like that. So, uh, and, it, and it's all done in a very simplistic way. Uh, Vlingo Streams, this is where um, uh, you know, basically we, we have data that streams, whether it's streaming for event sourced aggregates or streaming for um, just messaging between um, bounded contexts. And I don't know, I, I, I don't know how long I've, I've been talking here. Are you, are you sick of me yet? You want to see some code? I mean, I've shown you a little code, but maybe, maybe I'll just show you how some things work if you're okay with that. All right. Yep. Yeah, well, okay. Now this 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 is a very good question and I I want to say first of all, hiding the network is a good thing because leaky abstractions, right? We don't we don't actually prefer not to have leaky abstractions. So, but now here's the thing, right? The actor model has this kind of scary uh, service level agreement that when you first hear it, you just go like, no way, this can't be. It's called at most once delivery, okay? So actually, that's your friend because that means you don't even have to worry about did this node crash 
or something, and was my message not delivered? Because if that message, if, if you don't see an acknowledgement of that message, for example, so that's part of your contract between the two actors is, I will eventually see some kind of acknowledgement that this was received. Um, if you don't see that, then you can simply resend the message. So in effect, you get, you get, you know, I guess what some have called effectively once um, delivery, you know, so it may be delivered multiple times, but you need to be an item potent receiver. It's, but that's all part of the deduplication thing, right? So we're going to actually deduplicate right in the actor instead of trying to deduplicate in the infrastructure. And it just, you know, it's not a, it's not a negative experience. It's just a different way of thinking because we're, we're very used to thinking things complete, right? But you know what isn't actually true about that is that if an, if an exception gets thrown in your Java or C-sharp or whatever solution, do you even know that that exception got thrown? Usually not. Your context just disappears and something else is probably telling the user there's some weird thing going on right now, try again later, right? That's sort of like what we tell them. Instead, with the actor model, you get a crash, a supervisor is going to handle it. And it's a supervisor that's been well designed to deal with that situation. So it's just, it's just a different way of, a, of solving the problem. Thanks for attending. Yeah, have a good night. Okay, so let me... Um, I've got more room here than I thought I had. I know what you're thinking. Vaughn Vernon uses Eclipse? <laughs> yes, I do. I've promised the Vlingo team, or at least certain members of the Vlingo team that torment me constantly about using Eclipse, that I will switch to IntelliJ after we ship our first official production release. So, oh boy. But at least they'll be quiet, you know, or, or something. Can everybody see this? Can you see it in the back, or you need a little more zoom? Yeah? You're OK? OK, so what this is, this is, this is just a really basic introduction to actors. We're going to play a little ping pong game. And we have two actors. One is the pinger actor, and one is the ponger actor, OK? And this is a test that runs this. So we start a world. Remember I showed you that the actor model has a world. We start a world um, with default. So we're using the internal you know, uh, common sort of behavior of, this, of, of the world. And we name this world the playground. Okay, And then um, uh, we've got this little thing that tells us when we're done. And I'll, I'll explain that later, but this is something to deal with the asynchrony. You can deal with this differently, but I'm just showing you that these are really, truly asynchronous operating actors, okay? And that's why I'm using this approach. So what we do is we simply ask the world, actor four, this is called the protocol. This is the pinger, and this is the actual actor implementer of, of that protocol. And I'm passing in a constructor parameter to that actor. And that's taking the until. So I'm going to test until a happenings of one, right? Which just basically means something's going to happen. And I, and I block right here on this thread until that event happens, right? I think you can probably imagine how that works. It, it, behind the scenes, just a countdown latch, OK? And it's going to. It's going to count down one. And when that's done, this, this thread will unblock. But why do we have to block this test thread? Because if we don't, this is all asynchronous, and it falls off the end, and the world terminates, and you're done, and the test didn't even run, right? Or, or what's really weird is it might actually even finish before that sometimes and sometimes not. So yeah, you got to sort of wrap your mind around asynchrony. So we've got this pinger. Now notice, I'm not using the pinger actor. That's an implementation. I'm just using the pinger. What do I have here? I have a proxy. So if, I, if this proxy 
that's behind this interface, this protocol, doesn't exist. When I call this, it's generated automatically for you. You just don't even have to think about it. And then I get the Ponger class, uh, I mean the Ponger instance, and I pass the Ponger to the Pinger, right? Okay, how's this implemented? So I've got my Pinger protocol, it's an interface. Public interface Pinger extends stoppable, so I, I can tell myself to stop, okay? And I have a ping uh, behavior. I can receive ping messages. And so what happens, I tell the pinger to ping, right? And that's how I start the game. Now the implementation of the pinger is simply a pinger actor that extends actor and implements the pinger protocol. And I've got this state within, and the state is basically just a, a counter. And notice it's not an atomic integer, it's just an integer. I don't have to worry about uh, atomicity here because it's all in one thread. It's, it's, it's protected, right? The, it, it's thread safe. Um, because it's only processing one, on one thread at a time. And then I've got this uh, pinger, which is me. Now notice, I have to, I, I don't use this because this is an object. It's my object. Self as a pinger is a proxy of myself. And so I'm going to, when I receive a ping message, right, so the test is right here sending a ping message here. It's received asynchronously. And when it receives that message asynchronously, it simply counts like we would count any other Java int. And I'm going to log the ping with the count. The, the logger is asynchronous as well. That's why when, you, when this runs, you may not even see it reach 10. It may reach 8, but that's because the logger gets shut down before, you know. Anyway, there's ways around that, but it's just interesting that you have to just say, oh, that's right, everything's happening asynchronously. And uh, so we're just saying, okay, when the count is 10 or greater, I'm going to stop myself and I'm going to tell the ponger to stop. Where do we get the ponger? It was passed in as a constructor parameter, right? Or no? Oh, no, sorry. It's passed in to the ping, right? So, and then we have a lifecycle message that we can receive called after stop. And after we're stopped, we can, we can log pinger and then my address. Every actor has an address. That's its unique sort of identity. And I've just stopped. And then we tell the until. That, that, that that just happened, which is going to tell the test here, right? It counts down the latch. And um, we stop, OK? Let's look at the, at the ponger. So simply have a protocol here. The ponger can receive a pong, and the pinger is passed to it. What is the pinger? It is that proxy object, right? Which means I can send messages to it asynchronously. How do we pass it? We say ponger dot pong self, right? And again, self is a this, but a proxy to that. And so the ponger just receives the pong, logs the pong, and then sends the pinger, which is our argument, a ping. This is an asynchronous message. And so we're just going to do this 10 times. So let's run this test and see what happens. OK, so we're green. Oh, look at that. We actually finished this time. Oh, but notice we didn't see the output from the pinger actor that says, I just stopped because right, the world ended before that could happen. OK, we can, we can make, we could change that, but I'm just not going to bother right now because that's a, a detail. OK, so now, right, were you expecting something to happen really slowly? Right, it just, um, very high performance. Usually, 
you know, depending on the mailbox that you're using, you can see, you know, six million plus messages per second. We need to do some tuning to make that faster, but, um, you know, so one actor can, can go through six million messages per second or so. That's not too bad. Um, okay, and then for, let me just show you, for example, like we've got this user resource thing in another example uh, project. And the user resource is a, is a REST endpoint. And notice that um, even the REST endpoints themselves, well, obviously, they're, they're backed by actors. You don't have to know. You, you actually don't even implement an actor here in your resource. It's just handled for you. But you can be instantiated with a world. And now you can use the world to look up some runtime information. But now, when we receive a REST request, right, HTTP, for example, well, let's see. Let me just show you the mapping for us, for you. Um, yeah. So right here, this is a, a routes method that's just used to sort of bootstrap the, the mappings. And this is a post. So we post to slash users. And the body is going to be mapped into this user data. And we're going to handle that request in this register, right? So for example, we're going to receive that request here. Now notice, we don't return a response. We return a completes response, which is a, basically a promise that says, sometime in the future, I'm going to give you a response, right? Then we say, um, let me get a user state from this user data that was passed in in the body of the request. And then uh, we simply say stage, actor for. So we're looking up, right? We've got a stage here that, that our actor lives in. And we're saying stage, actor for um, the user protocol. And this means because this is a register, this actor doesn't exist yet. So we're actually getting the actor for the first time. And then we're simply saying, return completes with success of actor response. This is, this is being handled asynchronously, but there's no wait for that to complete. Whereas uh, if we look at a different one, such as let's change the contact information for a user. So we have the path users, user ID, contact, and um, we have a string parameter, which is the user ID in this case. And the body is mapped into a contact data, and we're going to handle that at the change contact method, which is this one. So we receive this message asynchronously. Um, we have our user ID, which is passed in on as a path parameter, and we have our contact data, which is automatically mapped from the body, and we simply say stage actor of the user protocol. And I'm going to use the address factory to, to create you know, j j a valid address to look up in the stage. This, is go this lookup happens asynchronously. Again, everything is asynchronous. And so I have this method, this you know, function that gets registered. And it's and then too. So this means that when I get that user looked up, I'm going to send an asynchronous message to the user with the new contact information of an email address and phone number, and then to user state completes with success of response OK, and then we serialize that back into the body. And so we're actually, this is where we provide the, re, the asynchronous response out of here, right? Otherwise, which means I didn't find my user, ultimately I didn't find the user, and I'm going to have to reply, not found, and I'm just going to, in the body, provide the location of the user that they thought they would find but didn't, right? I have a question. Uh-huh. Uh, you thought uh, you said it was about only business domain, but I think this code you won't discuss with business experts. I'm sorry, say again? No, 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 no. I'm, I'm showing, okay, 
sorry. Let me let me go let me go actually to the to the domain object. I just wanted to show you how the rest endpoint works. Uh, what? One uh, suggestion: Should we do a ten-minute break? Okay, ready. I thought I thought what I should do is um, let me show you an interesting, more well at least more interesting domain object. Um, you know, we do have several examples out there. If you've read if you've read my reactive messaging patterns uh, with the actor model book. We have all of those examples available for Vlingo, and, and those are on our examples uh, repository here, Vlingo reactive messaging patterns, okay? But um, I just want to show you, for example, an event sourced um, aggregate and how that can be designed. So this event sourced um, type here is it's an abstract base class that uh, provides event sourcing. I just want to show you too, like maybe something interesting about this. An event sourced is just a sourced aggregate or you know abstract base class. It is a sourced of domain events. There, there are any number of other kinds of sourced entities that you can have. For example, you can be command sourced, event sourced. Um, there, there's a special type for dealing with sagas or um, process managers, okay? And, uh, okay, so this discussion entity is an event sourced entity or aggregate and it implements the discussion protocol. So the discussion protocol handles close, it handles post for, it handles reopen, it handles uh, start with, it handles topic two. Okay. And notice again, this the name of this entity, discussion entity, is just an implementation detail. The outside world does not see something named discussion entity. It just sees discussion. Okay. And uh, so discussion entity has a constructor. I just want to point out that uh, I like the way of designing aggregates in such a way that there's, there's only one mutable object in the entire aggregate. And this is the state object. Notice that it's not a final, so I can change the, what this state points to, right? But the actual state object itself is immutable. So I've got the, where is it here? I've got the state object, so it's a discussion state, and the discussion state Notice, in, I don't know how well you know Java, but when something is declared final as an instance variable, it means you can't change it. You can't, you can't change this object. You could call a method on the object that would mutate it, but all of these objects are implemented as um, immutable value objects internally. So, so there's literally one place where a discussion entity changes and that is when you mutate its state using a replacement value. So I can tell this state to close and it returns a new state with open set to false. I can reopen it, setting, creating a new state with the open set to true, right? And topic with, so I can change the topic of this discussion um, by replacing the entire state. So the state itself is completely immutable and so the discussion entity now, when, let's do something interesting. So 
I'm going to start this discussion. It's a forum discussion. To start this discussion, I simply guard and say that if my state author um, is null, which means I don't have a state yet, right? I, I'm brand new, so I've just been instantiated. So I create, in my, in my constructor, I create a, a new um, em, sort of empty state. And when I start with an author and a topic, I apply a new domain event named discussion started with the tenant ID, the forum ID, and the discussion ID that I was instantiated with along with the author and the topic that were passed in. So this is what event sourcing is all about. And you divide the actor into two different um, sort of behaviors. One is the I need to mutate the state of this object, but the initial one is simply I need to perform a command. So this start with is a command that tells the discussion to basically initialize itself, right, with, a, with an author and a topic. So this apply method is implemented on the sourced aggregate that I showed you before. So this is an abstract base class. The apply method behind the scenes actually takes care of persistence automatically. Now it's interesting because actors tend to stay in memory for a long time until there's not enough room for a least recently used actor, for example. Which means that because my state has to represent my new state before I can handle my next command, I sort of go into this stasis that says until I know that this event has been safely persisted, this new discussion started event, I know I won't do anything. Actually, I don't even need to know that. I just say, apply discussion started. I'm just telling you that the framework or the, you know, the, the tooling behind the scenes handles that. At the point where I receive this invocation, apply discussion started, and I mutate my state by, cre by instantiating a new state object with the from the discussion started event, right, from the state of that, I'm now live again. And after this happens, I'm ready to handle a new command. But I don't have, as, as the entity itself or the aggregate itself, I don't need to know anything about that. But all that I need to know is that I apply, and there is no repository pattern. There is no, like I said, it's the simplicity stack, right? You've got controllers or, or rest endpoints, and you've got domain objects. And that's all that you need to worry about in your bounded context. You do have maybe some other types of endpoints like, OK, what happens if I, if I receive an event that I'm interested in? Well, you simply dispatch that to the domain model. right? It's just You just have this sort of outer layer that says, I'm infrastructure. I'm going to handle whatever outside stimulus I get. And, and, and by the way, I'm also going to, um, whenever you know, something is, is put into my journal, like this new event, I'm going to see to it that that event is published to the outside world. That's one that I permit to be published. And that's, that's kind of like you know, what you need to worry about. So, and, and so we tell the event sourced type, which is our base type, right? We tell it that I want to register whenever uh, the discussion started event is applied to myself. I want you to call back on my apply discussion started method, which is a private method, right? To tell me that I can now safely apply that to my, to my state. I can mutate my state to be that, you know, to reflect that. And then I have one of those for 
applied discussion closed, applied discussion reopened, applied discussion topic changed. So I have four events that I apply to myself and that are used to mutate my behavior. We're in the discussion entity. So, so an event sourced entity or aggregate root has to handle two concepts. The public, the, the public protocol is a set of commands that, are, that can be sent to it. And it also needs to know how to recover, how to mutate its state. And notice that these apply methods, the apply discussion started, apply discussion closed, apply discussion reopened, apply discussion topic changed, So whenever, whenever I handle a command such as start with and I apply the discussion started, eventually this method is invoked that gives me the opportunity to mutate my state. But there's another occasion when these methods are used. They're also used when this discussion is no longer in memory but someone sends a message to it and we need to recover it from persistence we, re, we basically reapply those events in the order in which they occurred to recover our state. And now the aggregate instance is, is ready to handle that. Again, it's all just automatic. All that you have to be concerned with is that you know how to construct yourself and you know, and you know how to handle the commands and you know how to mutate your state. You just separate those kind of, it's really two things mostly. It's just how to handle commands Everything else is handled automatically for you. Yep. So as I see um, the, the uh, Golingo pro uh, platform provides the actor model. Mm -hmm. yeah. mm -hmm. And um, you also have the streams module. And this streams module, um, does this implement the reactive streams interface? Not yet. It does. It, so not yet. It will. Not yet. Not yet. It will. Okay. Yep. Okay. And, uh, so what are the advantages of the Volingo platform compared to Akka? I think the question you expected yeah. already. Well, here's the thing. You know, honestly, I, uh, I can answer those questions, and that's fine. I just want to express due respect for the other team. But um, I'm much more business-driven than technology-driven, <laughs> and they are a very technology-driven company. And their, and their clients are very technology driven and there's a lot of complexity in that stack and I simply don't want it and I, and I reject it. So I'm, you know, I had other, I had other visions. In the, in I, had other, I, had, I had other ideas in my mind when I was using that platform and it didn't turn out the way I had hoped. So. Yeah, and, uh, so you think that it's too much of complexity in, in the ACA? Yeah, well, here's another, here's another angle on it. Let me just explain, too, right? So, I mean, some people will say that their Legom product is sort of the answer to, to you know, well, I'm building, we've built this now on top of, um, on top of Akka. And, I, you know, I just, honestly, I haven't kept up with that product. Um, I was, you know, I, I was familiar with it. And, and I read the documentation and, and so forth, the early documentation on it. My, my immediate impression from that was they know that the JEE community is dying and they're providing an EJB lookalike for that community that's reactive. And that's, and that, and, and I've, you know, anyway, I don't want to speak for them, but I have, I have asked that question directly and it's been confirmed. So go, go to Lagom and it says basically replace your enterprise Java solution with this whatever, like a boss, right? And that's sort of their message. And, um, and I just like, like, okay, like I said, I attended the micro, what is it called? Micro profile presentation at uh, micro exchange yesterday and, you know, it's just like 
JEE is so far from my mind, I can't even tell you the last time that I used an EJB. Um, it, it was probably like somewhere around 2003 or something, you know. So that's how far in the past that is, and I'm just not at all interested in trying to make anything that I do look like something that I abandoned 15 years ago or whatever. So, so that's that's part of that's part of what my thing is. The other part is. Um, where was I going with this? Because I didn't really want to talk about their stuff. But, um, oh, 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 yeah. So, now, again, I haven't, I haven't used Lagom ever. I don't even know if I've ever tried to compile it, but I read the doc documentation. And as I understand it, they are an extremely opinionated framework. And part of their opinion says you should use event sourcing. I don't know if that's the same today, but that was their initial message. You should use event sourcing. I teach hundreds of developers per year in many different kinds of, of organizations, fortune companies, startups, everybody in between. Almost nobody that I work with really wants to use event sourcing. That is not a dig or a slam against event sourcing because there are there are good reasons to use event sourcing. But sending everybody the message that you should be using event sourcing, I just think is the wrong message. Therefore, actually Vlingo supplies four different means of persistence. Reactively, you can use reactive OR mapping. In two different forms, you can use um, CQRS as blob storage, and you can use, and we support, event sourcing. So I just showed you we support event sourcing. But I'm not going to go into a company and say, bet your future on event sourcing. Because there are complexities related to event sourcing that some teams are just not prepared to deal with. And, and it will eat you alive if you're in that situation. And so I think that it's unfair for a company to send out a message that puts all these teams, you know, into a hype cycle that says use event sourcing because it's cool, you know, and that's really the message. It's not because you really should use event sourcing for everything. Even the person who is responsible for sort of reintroducing the idea of event sourcing over the past 10 or 12 years says absolutely don't use event sourcing for everything. So why would I disagree with that guidance. And yet, <laughs> there's a company that thinks they need to sell licenses badly enough to give bad advice to teams. So, Let me come again to the question. Did I make my point clear? Should I? <laughs> I'm joking. Yeah, so. I was asking, in the design process of the domain, the domain assign and you want to find out what your domain objects are in, uh, within your bounded context. So does uh, the reactive aspect already play a role? Or do you do your domain-driven design as ever, and then you do a, a reactive implementation of your DDD? OK, so um, well, I mean, you know, so let's say that we start with event storming and some yeah. scenarios, right? So we write some scenarios, we do some event storming, and, uh, and we discover at you know, sort of a, um, a design level that we need these aggregates. Well, then I would simply start um, implementing those, those aggregates as domain objects and as actors, if I'm, if I'm using Blingo, right? The reactive aspect comes when you implement it. Oh, well, not when you're modeling the domain, not when you're... Well, I th okay, but here, okay, but I, I, think, I think what you're saying, though, is that modeling is separate from implementation, and DDD says modeling is implementation. Okay, okay? so it, is that fair, Andreas, to, you know, I mean, I, oh, he doesn't want to say. 
No, but I mean, I understand what you what you mean yeah, by. In code, you use your actors when you're go, going to code. Yeah, but you're coding very quickly, very yeah, soon yeah, with true. DDD, right? Probably so, yeah. so the model yeah. the model is the code, and the code is the model. So when you say do you model before, no, you it, it it's one and the same, right? So there there is a point where you can where you can cut your um, the, the risk of failing with code, and so you use some artifact discovery up front that's a lot less expensive than writing code. But if you avoid writing code for a long time, you're in trouble. That's, I mean, that's completely true. If you ask me to answer, I would say, um, with this example, with the event storming, um, what, what um, stays around is the code, the implementation, and the shared understanding in your head, in everyone's head. Mm -hmm. And then you learn, and then you do some other stuff like visualizations of sticky notes that you throw away, or, or keep, or whatever, but yeah. actually it stays not around. It's the code and the shared understanding and the new learning. Yeah. Yeah, so, yeah, many times I'm asked, you know, about documenta documenting the domain model, and what it really comes down to is any any additional ceremony beyond the shared understanding, the, the mental model, what's in the code, just becomes overhead. And, and, it, and it tends to lag behind. It's not that you can't keep those things up to date, but generally you want those, that sort of documentation reflected in the, in the acceptance tests, right? So, so you kind of can use scenarios to, to understand how would I produce a test to to show that my domain model does what we've agreed as a team that it should do, and then you execute that test, that's part of the documentation. And in my workshop, I show, you know, a few different approaches to doing that. Some people would use Cucumber to do that or some sort of a specification by example, but you can also, you can use a Gherkin type of language or specification by example, put it in the comments above you know, in your unit test stuff and just implement your acceptance test using a unit test framework, it's potentially much simpler. And you also don't have as big a risk in sort of hiding the fact that your domain model doesn't actually do what the specification says it should do because you don't have that one-to-one -one visual with the code, right? You know what I'm saying? In other words, when, when you use Cucumber, and I'm, again, no disrespect or anything, but what I have seen is teams will create the Gherkin, and yet the implementation of the model behind will pass green and says that it doesn't, but it doesn't actually reflect the model, right? I mean, what it, I mean what, it doesn't reflect what the specification said it should actually do. It doesn't reflect the mental model. So you can actually fake out the team and implement something different. Whereas if you use a unit test, I mean, the code is right there. You put a comment above that has the specification in it, and that's the documentation, and the implementation is right next to it. You can look at line by line, right? Yeah? So if you have started a DDD kind of, uh, so you start a project and you apply the DDD methodology without knowing about this uh, reactive framework with billing and so on, how easy is it to then apply it as an add-on to an existing project? Or is it something you have to start from day Z? Oh, mm, yeah, that's a fair question. I mean, I probably would use it for a new microservice um, before I would encourage people to, because I actually haven't tried walking into a project and saying, let's, let's plug in Vlingo into part of this. The, uh, the thing is, sort of, that you have to be aware of is when you go async, you go async. You don't go kind of async, you know? And, and you can, okay, so, we have, do we have to end? So, okay, let me just try, I, I wanted a whiteboard or something, but um, what you can do is you can use, you can use, like, the rest endpoints, um, and dispatch to an asynchronous 
application service, right? So instead of, so you, you're, you're actually adding in a layer that I said you can do away with, with the actor model. Um, but you're adding that in because now you actually want your domain model to be non-reactive. And so what you do is you implement the, the application services, the application part, as actors, so you have the asynchrony between the REST oh. endpoints and something in the business side, but your domain model remains just objects, right? Plain old objects. I'm not suggesting that you do that, but that's one way to sort of get kind of the best of both, right? So you've got this existing domain model, and we can go in and replace, you know, make as much reactive as it's possible to do, you know, in the most, in the simplest way right now. Yeah. So we probably have to get out of here, right? Yeah, I've got some stickers here if anybody wants to pick up a sticker. I don't know Thanks. if there's any left back there. Yeah. Thank, yeah. Well, now, I, just, I just want to applaud you for putting up with me for so long tonight. I, I know I talked a lot, so thank you. Thanks a lot to the, uh,